So I have uh, Kristen on here with me, helping me out because basically I'm trying to do this presentation style. So I obviously, if that's the Zoom and that's the camera, um, I can't let people in. I can't see the chat. I can't any of that stuff. Plus, I thought it'd be good for Kristen to say hi. So we'll we'll wait till a couple more people get here. Um, she is um, Kristen runs our office. She does all of the scheduling, all of the dealing with the listing agents when you schedule something talking to your clients, answering all the questions, all that, all that kind of stuff. So I thought it'd be good for everybody to uh, to meet her as well. I recognize a couple of people's names from yesterday's Ask the Experts. So this will be a more in-depth dive on the uh, that little cheat sheet. But this way, we're going to do it a little bit differently. We're going to talk about electrical problems. We're going to talk about plumbing problems and kind of group them that way. But that's why the cheat sheet's so great because um, it's grouped by year, so you could just look at your house and it says 1964, you have that list right in front of you. So, uh, we have anybody else, Kristen? Uh, looks like we are have everyone as of right now. All right, so we'll just get started because we're recording this anyhow. Um, so thank you, good morning. Um, I have Kristen with us helping me out because, like I was saying, I've got the phone set up for Zoom so I can actually do a presentation so I can't actually see if people come into the waiting room or do chat or whatever. Um, the goal of this training is to give you guys some a little bit of expertise so that when you walk up to a house and there's you know what year it was built, you know exactly um, what kind of things can be deal killers for your clients or if you're the kind of person that buys your own properties, does flips, etc. You kind of know the things that cause big issues like polyvinyl piping. But today I want to take a little deeper dive. I want to be done in under 50 minutes, uh, but we'll do a little deeper dive into each one of those things and why they're bad and kind of just a little backdrop on it. And once we do do that, you will have about, you'll have more expertise and knowledge of this kind of stuff than even 90% of like home inspectors that are out there. Um, so first of all, we'll start with electrical panels. Um, all things electrical. The first thing that it comes up is from the 1880s to the 1930s, we have what's called knob and tube wiring. Um, you can kind of see this electrical thing here going through this little bit of porcelain. That was super common back in the early 1900s. Um, it's no longer safe. Obviously, you have exposed wires up in attic areas. Anytime you see this, even if it's not, um, what do you call it? If it's not, um, <laughs> my dog's on the second floor, like scratching like crazy. So I apologize, it's super distracting. Um, but this is not considered safe. And a lot of times they'll de-energize it and run new wiring, but they don't remove this. Um, in all, all situations, this should be completely removed from any old houses. So, you, but you tend not to see that like 1940 and newer. Uh, let's see. Single strand aluminum wiring. There's a lot of misconceptions here. Even home inspectors get this wrong. It was very common from the mid 60s to the mid 70s. And what it is, is you've got single strand, one strand of aluminum wiring. Now, there is some, some times when that is actually okay. So if you were looking at an electrical panel and there's just like, two um, aluminum wires running. If you know where they're running to, and in, in other words, they're running to the range and back, to the air conditioner and back, to one item and back, it's actually fine. That doesn't, nothing needs to be done with it. It doesn't need to be replaced. And that's the thing I see home inspectors write down all the time. They write down single strand aluminum wiring. But really, the problem is what's called uh, multi-branch single strand aluminum wiring. So in other words, it goes from the outlet, outlet, fan, TV, those are the kind of uh, aluminum wiring that should be uh, replaced. You'll also see what's called multi-strand aluminum wiring. So this is single strand. Multi-strand would be like lots of them together. They use that in modern day houses. It's totally fine. There's no issues with it. Um, here in the Arizona area, when you there's different ways that you can you are required to remediate aluminum wiring depending on the part of the country you're in. Um, in Florida, the insurance companies get very involved and they don't want you Sometimes your insurance company will actually make you rewire the entire house. So that can actually be a very expensive proposition. Here in Arizona, um, you can actually just do what's called pigtailing. So the last four inches of the line is switched over from aluminum to copper. But there's a special way that you have to connect those together. So one of the things that we do when we do an inspection is if we find the aluminum wiring, we'll pop open an outlet or two. And even if you see like a wire nut inside the wall, that's actually not done right. You have to either use um, a very specific uh, type of uh, wire nut, which is like a brand name Alubicon, 
or you have to put this little paste inside there because basically you have the, the same problem otherwise where the copper and the aluminum are touching and could be corroding each other. Um, but if you use Alumicon, so if you Google that right now, you'll see like a purple connector. And as you put the two wires in each side, um, the, there's this little gel in there that prevents them from touching and electricity gets conducted and there's no corrosion. Um, let's see here. Cloth wiring. This is a little bit confusing because we find it. And then when we find it, we have to say, okay, what I need you to do is now I need you to get with an electrician because some cloth wiring is okay and other cloth wiring is not okay. So as you can see in this picture, it's a little blurry actually, probably because it's so big, um, cloth wiring becomes very frail, very brittle. Um, the wires can become exposed, uh, but some cloth wiring actually has like a, a plastic uh, sheathing inside of it that is well, and the wire is well protected. So that's why when we find cloth wiring, we say, hey, we found cloth wiring. We're, you have to get an electrician in here to tell you that whether it needs to be replaced or whether it's fine. And I've seen electricians go in both directions with it. Um, we did like a 10 unit uh, apartment complex about two months ago and all that cloth wire had to be replaced, which part of the reason it starts to get so expensive is because it's all on the walls. So you got to replace all the drywall and the trim and the paint and, and all that good stuff. Um, more so on this, you got um, fuses. Uh, if you see fuses nine times out of 10, the whole fuse panel needs to be replaced. There is some times where you can use a fuse with a furnace in an attic and that's actually still okay. But fuses are known to only have a lifespan of about 50 years or so. And they stopped using them in the 1960s. So if they're still around, <clears throat> basically there's little mechanical things in there that causes it to trip. And uh, they are just, they're just not reliable anymore. Uh, the other thing is, is when they, if you can imagine in the 40s and 50s and 60s when they were putting fuses in, uh, there were really no computers, no TVs, not even really large refrigerators. Uh, they just are not, the, those fuses that were designed back then were not designed for the loads that we put on them nowadays. So outside of like a little fuse on a furnace, uh, most of the time fuses should be replaced. Um, electrical panels, there's several different kinds. If you see this one where if you have like black breakers with like a red, um, uh, sort of a label on it, that's almost always gonna be a Federal Pacific panel. The thing to know is that they just don't trip when they're supposed to. Again, um, also installed 40s, 50s, 60s, some into the late 70s. Um, but, you know, the way that we talk to a client about it is, um, look, there's nothing going on with this particular electrical panel, but you are inheriting kind of a known safety issue. If it gets overloaded, it might not trip and you might not want to be the person who owns the house, although all the houses in, in this block, in this neighborhood, um, have this same panel if they haven't replaced it. And the other thing I like to tell clients is like, look, you're buying a whatever, three, four, five, six hundred thousand dollar house, and you, you're buying it because it's the right schools, it's the right size, and the right garage. Um, you know, a panel might be two grand, maybe three grand. So don't, don't, don't let yourself go totally sideways on a $500,000 house that's all but perfect, except for a panel. And again, to the, old, to the other point, if I brought three electricians in here, I can tell you the story in a second, but you know, one of them would say, oh, I've never seen a problem with them. And the other one might say, well, it doesn't matter if it's more than 30 years old, those are mechanical things and they can't be trusted to work, just like mechanical items in your car. Um, other types of panels are Zinsco, Challenger, and then what's called early Sylvania. So what happened is Sylvania actually purchased um, Zinsco uh, when they, uh, like in the late seventies. And so there's some panels that are actually internally all the same Zinsco parts, um, but they just have a, a Sylvania label on them. So if we see like a, a Sylvania panel from like 77, 78 up to like 82, 83, then uh, um, we know that that's kind of a problem. More electrical stuff um, in, a, in a house in the, you know, prior to 1962, you're going to have uh, potentially ungrounded receptacles. But what a lot of people do is they change out those two-pronged outlets for three-pronged outlets, which is actually more unsafe than just the two-pronged outlets. If you have the two-pronged outlets, obviously, you, we've all seen, you know, um, outlets or, or, you know, things that you plug in that only have two and aren't grounded. That's fine. So our recommendation when we find someone that replaced three-pronged outlets or two-pronged outlets or three-pronged outlets is to either go back to two or to run the wiring required to actually ground the outlet. Um, 
it can be very expensive hypothetically to to um, ground it but sometimes you can get lucky so if you if you have an electrician open up the the wall the panel um if that box that's holding the the receptacle is um what you call it is a is a metal box a lot of times they can use that and ground right to that which if they can that'll save a bunch of money uh, one thing i didn't make a slide for and I don't know if it was Bruce or it was somebody else, but they asked about balloon framing. And I didn't make a slide for it because you don't find it very often, but I'll talk about it really briefly. A balloon frame house is how they built them basically like 1860s to like 1920. And the idea is if you were to look at a house that's built nowadays, <clears throat> there is a separation of extra layers of wood from one floor to the next floor to the next floor. And without that, uh, basically a fire could spread really quickly. So it's sometimes hard to tell whether you have balloon framing, but the balloon framing, if you can imagine there's two by, two by fours behind this wall here. It actually goes straight up and there's nothing, there's no separation between floor to floor. And basically fires spread like very, very quickly in that kind of a framed house. If you're going to, remember that? If you're going to, um, figure out whether or not you have a balloon frame house, you're typically gonna see it in the attic. Um, and, and you can kind of look at how it's built on the, you know, where the, uh, where the edge of the roof hits the side of the building. Now it's not as, it's not as bad of a thing in a one story house, but it's obviously um, a much worse thing in a, in a two story house. So if you ever have, or if you are dealing with a historic home and it can be remediated, it can be pricey, but basically we put extra layers of framing in to separate the floors to prevent um, fires from spreading through the walls. Okay, plumbing. Uh, you know, I haven't seen this much here. We see it a little bit. Um, parts of the country, it's very prevalent. Basically, late 70s to the mid 90s, you have what's called polybutylene. Um, it looks just like this almost every single time. It's funny, it's perfectly clear in my photo, not on the TV, but it's this gray piping with sometimes a black fitting and sometimes it's copper fitting. The black fittings, some, there's a lot of misconceptions. A lot of people spread old wives' tales about this stuff. It is true that in the beginning, those black fittings basically couldn't handle the heat. So you'd get a lot of water leaks right near the water heater. They just weren't rated for that kind of heat. Nowadays, what happens is the, the chlorine and whatnot in the water actually interacts with the poly material, and you'll get little pinhole leaks. And basically, um, you'll get leaks behind the wall. So, and I've done hundreds of these mold jobs, but and it's really unfortunate because what happens is the wall, the leak happens behind the wall. You don't know for days, weeks, right? Because it's like leaking behind the wall, little pinhole thing. And by the time you you realize there's a problem, you've got like, you know, a mold all inside the wall. So it is expensive. Some insurance companies, if they know you have polybutylene, they will not cover your house or they'll say, hey, we're not going to cover you for water damage. Um, and again, if you had to replumb a normal size 2,500 square foot house, you know, you might get a quote for 2,500 to 3,500 to, to replummet. You got to double that number because basically you can imagine you got to take out cabinets, you got to take out walls, you got to, um, you know, whatever the case may be, you know, rerun all this new piping, but then you have to like basically fix everything back up, paint, trim, drywall, et cetera. Um, I've actually had listing agents argue with me that, uh, no, 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 that's definitely not probably people. I'm like, I've done thousands and thousands of houses. I know what that is, but there is a AST, there's, there's a PV number and there's also an ASTM number and you just Google that right on the piping. Um, if you don't, if it doesn't come up as polybutylene right away, there's gonna be more than one ASTM number. And you can actually see here, you would get, you'd have one ASTM number for the fitting, one for this T-joint and one would be the piping. So at least after three tries, you would definitely find the uh, ASTM numbers. Um, are we getting any questions, Kristen? I can't see the chat. No, no questions yet. All right, cool. Sorry, just figured I'd check in, everybody. Plus, I can steal a drink of water <laughs> or coffee. Okay. Um, the other thing to know is that this is kind of a trick question, but sometimes polybutylene is found in older houses because they run um, the copper piping through the foundation. You get some leak at some point, and then they rerun new piping, and they ran it while they were using you know, in the 80s and 90s, they were using uh, polybutylene piping. They might already run it through. In these warmer climates, they'll run it through the attic sometimes. Um, so it is, you know, I've seen it plenty of times in houses from the 60s, 70s, got replumbed in the early 90s, and they have polybutylene. All right, another plumbing issue. 
Um, you'll see us add this as an informational piece. And I'm actually gonna tell you how you can figure this out for your clients. Um, the solder that was used to hold together um, copper piping before 1985, some of the solder had lead in it, which means that as you're running drinking water through, water through there, um, you could be getting lead in the water. So the way that you test for that, it's kind of a hassle. Um, normally, you could imagine taking a water sample. You want to like let the water run and purge for a long period of time so that you're getting like a, an accurate sample. Well, with lead in water, it's actually totally different where you, you actually have to let the house sit perfectly still for about six to eight hours. And then we actually, when we do take that sample, we take the first, what's called the first draw. So the second we open the, the water faucet, we take that very first water out of the system. Uh, yeah, and so you, I think that's about a $150, $200 sample. Um, and again, the whole hassle is you literally, you can't run any water. So it, usually you'll do it like in the middle of the day if the person who lives there leaves for work in the morning, you go by in the afternoon, take the sample. You can't run, you can't, you can't do it first thing in the morning. You can't, you can't have flush the toilet. You can't run, it, you can't do anything. In, you can't run any water anywhere in the house. So just know that that's a thing. Okay, next couple plumbing things would be for sewers. Um, and when these were installed, I don't have dates here, but basically galvanized piping was used in the 40s and 50s. The next one is, uh, what do we got here? Orangeburg and cast iron. Um, galvanized piping was used for supply line. It basically just corrodes out. And all of these piping, you gotta know that even if the material was great back in the 50s, it's now been 72 years from 1950 and the plumbing's just not gonna last that long. So at some point you have to dig it up and replace it. Um, Orangeburg piping, my guess is if you've been a realtor in Arizona for more than five minutes, you've heard of this. Basically it is like this compressed paper material for lack of a better explanation. So even if you try to go and hydrojet it, um, you're gonna, uh, you know, you're just gonna shred it up and then you'll never, you'll never actually fully solve the problem. What we actually see a lot of times with the cast iron piping is that it, it gets a little groove in the bottom of it, uh, which causes, again, just things to get caught up and, and blockages. Uh, the good news is, and again, you might know this already, but um, nowadays, like this wasn't the case like 10 years ago, 15 years ago, but now they can actually put a machine down into the sewer line and reline the inside of old piping that is still structurally sound, which is still expensive, but saves a lot of money compared to the old 10, 15 years ago, when you literally had to dig up the entire line and then replace the whole line by hand. So now what, you know, a normal line that needed to be relined would start at about 4,500 and usually runs about like $200 a foot. Um, whereas, you know, again, 10 years ago, it was thirty, forty thousand dollars to replace like a forty-foot um, sewer line, and it could get worse with other things. All right, um, I feel like I'm rushing through this. Any questions on plumbing? It's so weird to talk to my little phone right here as opposed to like a group of people. Um, okay, so we'll move on to asbestos. There is a ton of misinformation out there about asbestos, mm -hmm. mostly coming from the we do have one question. Street. What's that? We do have one question actually, apologies. All right, go for it. So what year was the lead soldering happening? Prior to 1985. Got it. Basically any copper piping before 1985, we write that down as a potential um, issue. Perfect, thank you. So with asbestos, this is really funny. I literally, um, oh I just, I couldn't help myself and I had to, um, I DVR'd Home Inspector Joe, just shoot me, um, on, on HGTV. And it was everything that I hate about the inspection industry. The guy is talking <laughs> about stuff. He's not making any sense. He's making stuff up. He's scaring clients. He's, he's super scaring clients. Then he's acting like the realtor, telling them what they should get done and negotiate. Huh? You know, how to fix the problems. I mean, the guy's the, like the worst case scenario for the inspection industry. And one of the things he did in the very first house I saw, it's like five minutes into the show, is he, okay. is, he, is he, can we mute that everybody, Kristen? Yep, got it. Um, as he says, uh, he goes, oh, that, that pipe um, insulation is, this he is up in New York. There's definitely asbestos and that all needs to be removed. Well, okay, so the first thing is, 
some houses have asbestos. It does not have to be removed. That's not, it's not, there's no rules saying you have to remove it. Now, if you do remove it, you're going to want to take some precautions because it's dangerous for your lungs, which I'll explain in a second. Um, but if a insulation on a pipe is intact and it's not like, it's not damaged, it doesn't have to be removed. Now, if you go do remove it, you have to take special precautions because um, the asbestos fibers basically um, cause lung cancer, asbestosis, and mesothelioma. Um, another a misconception about asbestos is that it's only in old houses. It's not true. Um, the EPA governs asbestos and uh, remediation and testing for commercial buildings uh, federally, nationwide. Um, they do not do anything with regards to residential uh, properties. That being said, some states, because it's state by state, have decided to basically copy the federal requirements for commercial buildings and residential buildings. And states that do do that um, have, there's no age requirement, okay? The, the, the reason people think there's an age requirement is because there was, I'm, I'm trying to remember now, in like 1987, there was a couple things that happened and they started to outlaw it, but then all these things were grandfathered in, you're still allowed to use it. You can actually go to Home Depot right now and buy joint compound and some of them actually have asbestos in them. And so in, a, in states like say like Colorado, in Colorado you have to, you have to test. If you're gonna, this is my house. If I were gonna renovate more than 32 square feet, it doesn't, my house is brand new, built last year. Um, we would have to test in Colorado if this house were in Colorado, if we were renovating more than 32 square feet. Um, so people don't understand that, they don't believe you. They think it's just old houses, and then I show them exactly where the state of Colorado wrote that up. Now, in Arizona, we do not have that rule. You could tear up whatever you want in a, um, in a residential setting. No one's going to care. No one's going to bother you about it. That being said, it doesn't mean that you might not still run into asbestos. You just didn't test, so you don't know that it's there. Um, asbestos has been used in over 3,000 building um, uh, type materials. Like it's used on the back of tiles. It's used in tiles. We found it in joint compound. Um, it's sometimes used in the, the sheathing of wiring. Um, again, it's, and it's, it's, by the way, it's a lot of other things. It's sometimes in brake pads. It's sometimes in cigarette filters. Um, it's in all kinds of things. Oh, and a little tidbit. You'll notice if you're ever at home in the middle of the day and you see commercials uh, for mesothelioma, the reason that the attorneys chase mesothelioma and you never see them go, hey, did you get lung cancer from asbestos or did you get asbestos from cancer? It's because that's from a prolonged exposure. They've actually proven that mesothelioma can be caused by only one time exposure to asbestos. And therefore that's what the attorneys pursue because obviously that's much easier to prove in court that you were exposed to it one time as opposed to, well, it serves 20 years and we know blah, blah, blah. You can match how that goes. So that being said, your client could still if, if they're going to renovate their house, renovate their kitchen, it's from the 70s, whatever, it's from the 2000s, and they're worried about it, they, of course, can still test for asbestos. And the way that it works is in, in areas that are man mandated, like let's say a commercial building, the number's a little bit different. If, it's more, if you're going to renovate more than 160 square feet, then you have to uh, do this testing for asbestos. The way it works is you take a little piece of, of the material, about a the size of the quarter, goes into a bag, we label it. And then we take it out of the lab and they look under a special kind of microscope and they tell us whether there's uh, asbestos in there and then whether or not uh, the asbestos is above like 1%. Like in other words, the percent of the material that is asbestos. Um, for an area, you have to take random samples. All the samples have to come back negative. And the way the numbers work is you take three samples of, of each material for less than a thousand square feet. And then you take five samples if it's between a thousand and five thousand square feet. And you take seven samples if it is more than five thousand square feet. <clears throat> and again, this is per material. So if you're doing a bathroom in a, in a commercial setting, let's say you've got the back of the tiles, the tiles, you have the drywall, you have trim, you have, uh, what else do you have? Um, you have the wiring, you have uh, the mastic on the back of the tiles. I mean, each one of these things is, is three more samples. Um, so again, three samples per material all have to come back negative before you can actually move forward and go ahead and assume that there's no asbestos there. So um, it does, it can get pricey. Like we've actually done houses where 
they're they're demoing the whole it's you know it's a 1905 house and but in an up and coming area and they're gonna demo the whole thing and build one of those like three story um you know super cool modern houses so you literally have to do you have to do every single material so if you think that like that drywall is installed at a different time with this drywall that's three different samples or five different samples each you know there's one commercial building i did where uh you know they have uh white it was all the same tiles but some were white, some were red, and some were blue. So I had to do seven samples of the white tiles, and then five of the red and five of the blue. Even though they all look like they came from the same place, that's the way the, the rule's written. So, um, so again, usually people are shocked when I tell them it doesn't matter the year. Um, the way that the EPA writes it up is that if uh, if you if like in my house, if we were if we had to test, if Arizona said you have to test in residential settings, I would either have to have a letter from my builder stating we guarantee there's no asbestos and good luck getting that letter or you have to do the testing so that's how that works people are usually shocked to hear that um so we kind of talked about this when and where is it found the reason if you don't know what asbestos is it's actually a mineral it's like it's found in, in rocks and it's actually the re except for it causing all those lung problems it's actually great material it doesn't conduct electricity it's got some great thermal properties it's relatively inexpensive um and and, and so basically it, it, do, it does all these like, from a building material um, standpoint, it's actually really great, but when you basically break it up and you breathe in the fibers, it's really, really bad for you. So that's, um, I kind of covered that. <clears throat> so we talked about how to find it. You take all these samples. If you do, then basically you, you have to do this like hazmat setup where you put plastic bags up, you have negative air, you have heat filters running, and the idea is, as you're breaking up this material to demo it, all these fibers are gonna become airborne and all of it gets bagged up. You can see all the protective gear that they're wearing with the masks and everything. And then at the end, you have to do this really um, aggressive air sampling and look at it under a microscope to prove that the area is totally clean from, from asbestos fibers. Okay, questions on asbestos? No. Nope. Looks like none. All right. All right. Hmm. So a common thing that I'll tell people, and oh, this is another good story. I went into a uh, a real estate office one time, and this is in Colorado. So there you have to test in um you know uh, residential settings, and the the lady who was running the office was like, well, we fired our last home inspector because he missed asbestos, and I go, asbestos is not part of the home inspection, like. He didn't miss asbestos. Oh, yes, he did, because it came back. I go, I know, but a home inspection is not designed to find asbestos because, again, there's over 3,000 items. So there's this common misconception where people go, oh, can you check the house for asbestos? You're like, well, no, because the right way to do that, again, would be to test every single material under a microscope, which costs money. And so, one, it, it's kind of cost prohibitive unless you're going to tear the house down because, again, the houses that we did would usually run like four to $5,000 in testing per house. <clears throat> um, but then the second thing is, like I said, you have to cut a hole in the wall, in the material. You got to take some of the material down to the lab. So most sellers are not keen on you cutting holes in the wall only to come back and say, yeah, we found asbestos so we're no longer going to buy the house. So you can imagine how well that goes over. All right. Okay. Building materials. Okay. Have you ever seen that like composite siding? It's like pressed wood. Um, it's it's not, I don't know, it's maybe on like 10, 15% of the houses here, a lot of the 80s and 90s. If you don't keep it sealed, the problem is because it's that pressed material, it just absorbs water like really quickly, right? But there's also, there in, in the from like 90 to 97, I forgot to put the date on there, um, Louisiana Pacific made this type of composite and it was way worse than all the rest. So we have a write-up for that if it's the years of it. Um, it, is an, it is extra um, problematic because, again, the siding is just going to deteriorate extra quickly. Uh, it wasn't built very well. So 90 to 97 is that Louisiana Pacific materials. Okay. Now, all right, lead paint. I know that realtors know a lot about lead paint because you got to go take all the classes and it's in your disclosure and it's in the contract. And, pre-1978, but let me just give you a little background on it. Um, when you go to the EPA and you take their, their class, one of the first things they said is, does anybody know 
why lead paint was even like a thing. And we were all kind of like, uh, no, not really. Well, because it's actually really good stuff. So if you remember back in the, like the 1910s, 1920s, you had a little farmhouse, little whitewash fence. Well, they literally have to whitewash the fence like every single year. Well, lead paint started to come around and the paint lasted so much longer that it, uh, it basically, you could do it like every five years or so. So it was just a much better product. It wasn't until later that they had found out that if you um, had, if you had a, if they had, if someone ingested lead paint, you might have uh, medical problems from it. So as an adult, if you ingest lead paint, you're going to, um, you're just going to get high blood pressure. It's not the end of the world. But as you probably know, for children, it's very bad. It causes uh, severe learning disabilities. One of the worst case scenarios I heard was, um, <clears throat> uh, I think it was a realtor and she, she had a daughter. She had all the symptoms of lead paint poisoning. They just couldn't figure it out. They brought in um, some people to, to test the whole house for lead paint. And they actually found it inside the cabinets and they were storing all their drinking um, glasses upside down. So. Of course, the adults didn't notice. The girl ended up with all these problems. It's just a super sad story. Um, if you do find lead paint, again, before 1978, they, it, they actually put out to all of these paint building companies that in 1969, hey, we're making this illegal on this date. I think it's March 31st, uh, March 1st, 31st, 78. Um, so you do not find a lot of lead paint in houses during the 70s. Um, if you do test for it and you do find it, like it's really common when you're getting new windows. So they'll do, and let's say, let's say it's 1965 house, you're getting all new windows. They'll do all the lead paint testing around the window. If they do find lead paint, they basically put up a little barrier and then they put all the materials in there and they take it out to the trash. So there's no special way to get rid of it. Whereas if you find asbestos, that has to go to like special landfills and all that stuff. The lead paint, the whole point is we just don't want the lead paint dust to be spread around the house in a way that can be ingested. So it just, you put some plastic up, you, you rip out the stuff and you literally just take it out to the trash behind the garage. There's nothing with nothing more special to it. <clears throat> All right, two more building materials that not everybody's heard of, or I should say overly familiar with. Um, Chinese drywall, the big housing boom, construction boom in the er mid early 2000s um, caused uh, builders to import uh, drywall from China. And what ended up happening was the Chinese drywall put off way more sulfur in the air than, than the American drywall did. And so you could see here this picture. Oh, that's terrible. It looks perfect on my iPad, just so you know. Um, it gets this, this, this is, these are like the little copper coils inside of like an air handler. And basically, normally they would be copper colored. And here you could see they're black. So this same black, like matte, fat, black chalkboard kind of look um, also happens to copper wiring. And so what happens is you got Freon running through there this black corrosion thing happens, you get leaks. Well, what ended up happening, so you get like $60,000 worth of damage. I've, I've traveled all around the country doing Chinese drywall testing. I went into New Orleans, like on a one day trip, this guy had two furnaces or two air handlers up in his attic. Um, they looked just like this, water damage throughout the whole house. Um, and it was like $60,000, right? Well, here's the thing, the insurance company was basically hiring the engineering firm who hired my company for all the testing. Um, because they're like, if it's Chinese drywall, we're not covering it. The, the insurance company's attitude was, uh, that's like buying a car, you have car insurance, and then the transmission goes out. And usually they want all those cases. So they'd rather pay the engineering firm and my company five grand than to pay the, 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 the claim of $60,000. So that's how that, well, I get most of it that caused the problem is out because it does cause these kinds of problems. But as a, as a, a warning, we always have our inspectors at least know how to talk through all this stuff so that they do do a, 19, a 2004, 2005 house and they open up the electrical panel and the, and the, 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 um, the wires are black, like they understand why, you know, what would happen there. Uh, but most of it's been handled and taken care of. You don't find it too much, too much, very often. Okay, and the last thing that I know a lot of people have heard of is what's called vermiculite. Oh, I, I put here lack of insulation and vermiculite. You know, old houses just don't have any insulation and it's a good idea to add insulation. I'm not telling realtors anything they don't know already. Um, vermiculite looks just like this. And it's like this little, I don't know, like, like it looks like a, like a breakfast cereal, right? Like the brand or whatever. And um, the, that vermiculite is actually um, has asbestos in it. 
So if we do find that, if this is actually, this was installed in about a million houses across the whole United States up to through about 1985. Um, you don't want to go in that attic because if you're disturbing that, again, those fibers could be becoming airborne. But we could take some of this down to the lab and we could have the lab tell us whether or not that that's asbestos or not. So if you have, now sometimes people could confuse like that blown in cellulose. So if it looks like somebody ripped up an old newspaper, that's cellulose. If it looks like this kind of pebbly stuff, uh, there's a chance that that has asbestos in it. So not everybody's seen that or knows about it, um, but that's it. So look at that, 37 minutes. I know we don't have a huge crowd today, but do we have any questions? Checking, not at the moment, but they may be typing. Well, how many people do we have in here? Uh, we have eight in here. Oh, we, we jumped up in numbers. Now, if anybody wants, or if you were late, um, I will download this and edit it, and then it will be available. Um, so if you want it, we'll have access to the whole recording so you can listen to the whole thing from the beginning. It just takes a few days to make all that happen. Oh, Julie says that she doesn't have any questions, but she loves all the information you provide, and thank you. Uh, thanks, Julie. We'll see you, what, I think on March 2nd? <laughs> oh, <laughs> and then we did get a question. When was Orangeburg piping installed? Oh, sorry, Burr. Um, it's most common in the, like, in the 50s and the 60s. I don't know that I have the exact date. I can look for the dates, but it kind of, it kind of goes neighborhood by neighborhood. You know, and speaking of that, I want to talk about one other thing that's another, I feel like half my days are spent, um, fixing misconceptions. Some realtors tell their clients, hey, you only got to worry about getting, uh, a, a, whatchamacallit, a, uh, a sewer scope on an older house. They have these rules. Well, if it's Sun City and it's before 19, let me tell you something. I have a brand new house. I did a sewer scope on it and I found that vendors had poured all this paint down the drain. So any year house, like of new builds too, we find problems all the time. You can have, if the ground under the sewer is a little loose, you could have a little soft, you could have an offset, which will cause blockages. You can have root intrusion. Um, you could have people that live there for 10 years and poured oil and uh, grease down the drain. So again, I'm not gonna tell somebody what to do. I just say, listen, our job is to make sure that you don't inherit problems unknowingly. And if you don't look at the inside of the sewer line, you might inherit a problem unknowingly. So consultative sales person in me says, you pay and you learn, or you don't pay and you don't learn, you as the consumer, it's your choice. But problems happen in all age houses. I mean, we literally did a new build, I think two weeks ago, and they, they the line was running out and then they literally just ran it right back into the house. Like if the second somebody would have moved in there, they would have had they would have had backups within like two weeks. So mistakes happen, problems happen. Some people say, I don't want to spend two hundred dollars and find out there's nothing wrong. Other people say, Man, I'd really love to spend two hundred dollars find out there's nothing wrong and feel comfortable about moving forward with the purchase of my new house. So just my little tidbit on sewer scopes. Yes, and then Julie was asking uh, when the recording's complete, where will they be able to find it? Uh, I have a, we have a YouTube site and it'll be on our website. Perfect. We'll have, for Julie, anybody else listening, basically what I'm doing is I'm, I'm putting together all of these trainings and recordings and then they're all going to be housed in an agent training section of our website that isn't done yet, but will be done probably within the next two or three weeks. Excellent. And if you've got any requests, um, I mean, I have probably about 18 classes that I'm going to do. Uh, but if you have any requests for something that you think would be something we would know something about, um, we're always open to ideas. We're happy to uh, provide whatever we can. All right, anybody else? Oh, let me go back here. If you want our contact info, I don't know if everybody in this class was uh, on the Ask the Experts yesterday. If you email me at Curtin Inspector for Coffee, or you can scan that with your camera and they'll download our contact info. I actually have a two page PDF cheat sheet where uh, it gives you the years. And then based on the years, it'll tell you like kind of the, the big problems Orangeburg piping 
cloth wiring, aluminum wiring. So you can know that from based on your cheat sheet, if you're walking into a 1975 house with your client, these are like the potential problems that will come up during the uh, uh, inspection process. So if you want that, just email me and um, you'll have that for the next time you walk into an older house. Oh, and Sangeetha said, thanks, Kurt. Ah, you're welcome. All right, if that's it, no, then I will, we'll let everybody run and thanks for attending training. And, you know, I just hope you've met Kristen now briefly. So if you call the office, she's the friendliest person you'll ever meet and she'll take good care of you. And um, we'll get your clients all taken care of and make sure they don't inherit problems unknowingly. All right, everybody have a good morning. Bye now.